My name is Bruce. I'm the author of Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, um, also a book called Programming Phoenix. And I think Naresh was going to say I'm also the author of a book called Bitter Java, but you don't want to remember that one. Um, so in this, in this session, we're going to talk about a framework called Phoenix Live View. So let's go ahead and write some code. Um, how many of you have heard of a, a game called Conway's Game of Life? Okay, so about half of you. So it's a game that's played on a grid. There are cells on the grid. They're going to be live or dead. Live will have a, a dot like this one, and dead will be empty. And each cell has neighbors, and we count the corners so that this is a pattern in the game of life where this cell has two neighbors, and this cell, this orange cell, has three neighbors. Everybody got it? And so the rules are that if in the next generation, if any cell has exactly three neighbors, it will come to life. If it has fewer than two neighbors, it will die of loneliness. Or if it has more than four neighbors, it will die of overcrowding. Okay? Others will stay the same. Okay, so your quiz. What are the what are the four rules? What's the first one? Three if something has three neighbors, it creates a new life, right? What happens if there are fewer than two cells? It dies. More than three cells? It dies. Otherwise, it stays the same, right? So we're going to code the game of life in a framework called Phoenix. And I want to tell you a little bit about um, Phoenix Live View. Um, I've downloaded the Phoenix Live View example, and we'll use that as a template so we won't have to do the boilerplate setup. Um, and just so you can see exactly what I've changed so far, I've only changed these two files. I fetched my assets, right? So, um, so Phoenix Live View uses JavaScript under the hood, but doesn't require you to write any custom JavaScript yourself. And then I've also changed one security code in this file called endpoint, just to make it compile and run, and everything else is, is the same. So, so Mix is the um, Phoenix catch-all command for the development environment. We're actually going to start a server with this application. And I want to show you a couple of examples in Live View. So I'm going to navigate to localhost 4000. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And so these are a couple of Live View examples. Um, let's talk about the individual pieces. So here's an example. And basically, everything that you're seeing, all the code is done on the server side. There's no client side custom JavaScript at all. Okay, so that, you know, all of this is running on the server side. It has Erlang behind it so that if something happens so that it would crash. So we've, we've basically built in a custom crash. Um, if the temperature gets higher than 75, what happens is OTP kicks in um, and restarts the process in the last known good state, which was the starting state. So I want to point out that this is fairly performant, right? So this is a, a game. Remember, all of this is server side. So the performance is fairly good. Any mistakes are my own. You know I'm not very good at snakes. Um, and actually, you can see that we're actually fast enough to, to power things like animations. Again, everything, every change is computed on the server side. Okay? So we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to write a program in Conway's Game of Life. So we need to start this on the Elixir side. That's actually where we're going to spend most of our time, um, creating the board and the rules of the game and so forth. Okay, 
So, we're in live view here. How's the font in the back? Um, I know the left-hand side, I can't change that, but how's the font in the, um, in the right-hand side, this part right here? Okay, in the back? Better? Okay, good. Okay, so um, we're going to create a new file. And so there are, two, there are two directories to pay attention to here. One is demo, and that's where the, um, where the back end files are. And one is demo web, and that's the, where the front end files are that are related to controllers and so forth. That's where we'll put our live view files. Let's go ahead and start with a back end file. Let's create a file called life. Um, demo.life. Okay, so this is going to be um, a life board, and life is played on a grid, right? So a grid has a height and a width. And let's have a default height of three and a default width also of three. Let's talk a little bit about the data structure that we're going to use to, to save the grid itself. Now, in a functional program, um, so in, in many object-oriented style languages, I might use a matrix or a list of lists, right? But in functional programs, those data structures are immutable, so sometimes it's impractical to use a data structure that's nested. So um, often when I'm coding functionally, I want to keep my data structures as flat as possible. And that's what I'll do here. So I'll, I'll save the board, or we'll call it a grid. And I'll save it as an empty map. In Elixir, the braces are reserved for tuples. So we have a percent on the front end of, of map constructs. So now I have a, um, so I'm going to start mix in the context of my application. Save that. Now I have, I have this life, and it has a struct, and that struct is, has a grid, which is my map, and has a default height and width. And so um, I, could, I could create a new life. And get the height and width. OK, that much is working is working fine. Let's, I never did like this syntax. So let's create a prettier name for that. So let's actually just create a function to do the same thing. And I'm going to create um, a new struct. And the attribute is going to be um, key value pairs, a list of key value pairs. This, is, this means um, set the default value if none is provided. So um, in this case, we're going to say, this is the struct, right? I could say life. But instead of doing this, if I change the name of that, I want, it to, I want Elixir to track me. So there's a, um, a module, um, module attribute for that called module. And we'll use this instead. So basically, this is the structure that we define right here, right? Or actually, I can say module dot that. Let's see how that works. OK, now I can say, um, so I'm not using, I could actually use those attributes. Okay, so now I can actually take, um, I can say life, 
new, and I could say, I could override one of the default attributes like that. Okay, so, so good so far. Let's say that the on state is, um, I don't know, we'll, maybe we'll have it, or let's say a live state we're going to represent, let's make an emoji. Maybe something like this one or this one. Yeah, one of those will work. Okay. Let's put quotes around that. And for the live one, we'll pick that one. And for the dead one, we'll pick that one. Okay. Okay, so now we have um, live and dead cells. So let's fetch something from the board. So we're going to take a board, which is something of this structure right here. And it's going to take an X and a Y. And so actually for this grid, let's make the, um, the keys be tuples, be two tuples, right? So I could say map.get board.grid and um, I want to get um, the tuple x comma y and then if there's nothing in it I can provide a default value of dead, right? So now let's see Okay, life not, dot new, and I can, I can pipe that into, use that as the input to um, life dot fetch. And so the board is my first argument, and that's created right here. And so let's get whatever's at one, one. Oh, right there. Okay. So we're working fine. We got a dead cell. That's exactly what we want to happen. Okay. Okay. So now we need to start thinking about um, printing out a representation of the board. Or which way should we go? Um, let's create a new random board so we could have some data to work with. new random, and let's say that this takes a height. Okay, and so this is going to um, okay, so how are we going to do this? This is going to take a for comprehension, so let's say for x taken from 1 to width and for y taken, taken from 1 and we're going to execute this code in the middle and then we're going to start with a with a list that has live and dead And we're going to shuffle that to put it in a random order and take the first one. Okay. And so what I need to do, that's the cell, right? So now I have a cell. And now I need to to build an x, y, or, or a key value pair. And so the key is what? It's the x, y coordinate, right? And the value is the cell. So now this should give me a, um, this should give me at least a, um, 
at least the grid for my life game. And now I need to return a structure Take this guy, and I want the height to be the width is going to be width, and the grid is going to be grid. All right? Okay, so I think that we have something that will work here. So let's try to do a... Um, Try to see if we can, yeah. Let's say line number 12. Oh, thank you. Hey, types would have saved me there, wouldn't they? Thank you. Okay, what do we got? Syntax error before, we're going to have a few of these, so bear with me. So in line 21, oh, this is a two-tuple, right? This isn't a, um, and we, we probably want to put that into, yeah, we want this to go into a map, don't we? Okay. Okay, so now we should be able to say life. We want a five by five grid, right? Looks like it's working perfectly. Okay, now we're getting pretty close to having the basic board, and we're getting pretty close to, um, to time to, to create the next generation. For right now, let's create a pretty version of the board. Okay, and so basically for, for this, we're probably going to, um, we're probably going to want to convert each row to a string. So I'll say for, uh, for y taken from 1 to board dot And we want to, and we want to basically generate a row. And then we want the board, and then the row, right? And then the, yeah. Okay. Okay, and now to generate the row, let's say um, we have, we have a, the, we basically have, we need to iterate across the board, uh, across the, across horizontally now. So now we can say for, and this is actually the y coordinate, right? So I could say for x taken from, One to board and then I want to basically return the character of the board which is fetch right so now I'm at board or fetch X and Y right and that's going to give me a list of of um, characters, and I'm going to join that on the empty list, right? And now I can join this, on new line. Let's see what we have now. And what are we trying to do? OK. 
Okay, and then we want to pipe this much. We're going to pipe that to life dot, right? Okay, now we're getting pretty close, right? So that's, that prints a generation. <coughs> so it's about time to start working on the rules of the game. It's going to be really close, folks. So it's about time to start working on the rules of the game, so let's do that now. So what's the first rule? Okay, and we have a, um, a neighbor count, and we have a cell. N is less than 2. What happens to these? Right? And similarly, when n is greater than 3, they die, right? And we don't really care about the cell in these cases, right? Rule sub n and the When n is 3, right? And for n and cell, so those are the rules of the game. Now I have to create the next generation, right? Then, so the next generation of a board so for x taken from oh we need to count neighbors don't we the neighbors of uh, board at x and y Okay, so what's the best way to do this? Let's go low tech just to be safe. So I have basically have x and y. I have three of those, and there's going to be x minus one to x plus one, like that, right? I have three of those, and I want to do, these are all y minus 1, right? These are all y plus 1, and this we don't want, right? Did I get that right? Yeah? We have a closing comma to delete, right? And we want to pipe this to, I'm going to map over that, dot enum, dot map. I'm going to map over that, and I'm going to call fetch. And I'm going to fetch from the board x. Oh. And I'm going to call, and here I'm going to call ooh, I can't use X and Y, can I? Oh, I'll call this X, X, and Y, Y, right? No, that's right. I can't use X and Y here. X, X, and Y, Y, right? So I'm going to fetch X, X. Is that it? So I fetch them. 
and now, now I need to filter by live, right? Where that guy is equal to, right? Is that it? Okay. So, let's try to compile this much to see where we are. It'll be a miracle that neighbors is unused, rule is unused, and board is unused in 62. So, I bet we're okay in all those. Yep, we're okay. We're about to use them right now. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes. I think that'll be enough. Let's see. Okay, so the next generation is for x taken from for x taken from board dot width, and that's I actually want that to be a range, right? And y taken from to board. Board dot height, and we want to collect tuples now. We want to collect key value pairs, right? So this is x, y, and now we need to we need to basically process, get the next cell, right? So this is. So this is what we want to get um, in. We want to pass. We want to get the rule. So that is the neighbor count, right? Which is neighbors. And the cell. And the cell, which is fetch okay, I don't know if I'm feeling it, feeling kind of rushed today. okay, what's happening here sixty four anybody see it sixty three Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, did I save? Okay. What do we see now? On 64, missing Terminator. Okay, I said there would be plenty of this, and there are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, how about that? This is a tuple, right? That's a tuple instead, and that's rule. We need to close that. That was going to fail doubly, wasn't it? Okay. How are you feeling? We're gonna get it. So let's see if we've got a um, if we can take our, our next generation board from so our board is equal to life new random for five five right and I want to pipe that to life next. Next generation. That looks pretty good. Ah, I'm feeling it. Okay, so now what we need to do is create a route. We're almost done, believe it or not. 
So now we're going to create a route for this thing. So I'm going to the router. And let's just take the pattern. So basically what's going to happen is any new uh, web request is going to come in um, on the path. And if I mark the route with live, it's not going to go to a typical Phoenix renderer. It's going to go to a live renderer, right? And what that means is it's going to basically start a loop, right? And that loop is essentially an OTP loop. So let's take one of these, make it look like this. So if I go to life, I want to go to life, live, it's almost a tongue twister, right? Okay, and we need to create that file, right? So I'm going to um, the live template here. Let's take a look at one of these things to see what it looks like. Okay, so the anatomy of a Phoenix Live View is that when something comes in on the route, it fires the mount first. And all this does is stuff a key value pair, right? So this is the data model for your application. And then that data model gets shoved through a render, right? So, and then if you want to update it, you update it through OTP events, right? And these come in as handle info if you're sending it from your application or handle event if it's coming in from a JavaScript web click or something like that, right? In this case, we get this tick message and that's coming in from this timer that gets sent at the intervals of a second. And so this looks like something we can use. So let's go ahead and grab this. And we'll use this as the foundation for our, our clock live, right? So, new file, life, live, ex. Okay, and this is life. Okay. So if we go here, we should see the same. If we go to I should see the clock. And this clock is actually being created in our live view, right? So here it's straight HTML except this substitution. And this substitution, since this is a live view, live template, this substitution is going to get updated every time that there's an event. <coughs> and um, in live view, we'll actually process the bare minimum that needs to happen um, to, make this, to make this page render. Okay, so let's take over this for our own. We're going to maintain this timer call because I think that we'll need it. And in the socket, we're going to say, we're going to put hello world in there instead. I don't need the put date anymore. And we're going to we're going to live render. So we're going to say at hello. Here we'll put. Let's put that in there. Okay. Uh, put date. So I've call that somewhere else. Oh, right here. And handle info tick. So. Um, Let's just return the socket here and just do nothing when we tick. Okay. So now we should see. Um, so basically what I've done. So remember when something comes into the socket, it calls mount first, right? And in mount, all this is is a key value pair. And we've put the value of world into the variable 
um, into, into the key value set of, of hello, right? Into the key of hello. And then we've said, plug in hello right here, right? And now we get to tie everything together, right? Because we have a clock. The clock is ticking every second. We have a, um, a board. And so now all we have to do is mount this board and hit the next generation, right? So let's go ahead and mount the board first. Life is equal to, um, what is it? It's life dot new random. Let's do something like 50 comma 50, right? And then we're going to assign life, and that is going to be life. But up here, we need to use, we need to render that in safe HTML, and we need to render, we need to um, do this, something special to render this. This is life dot. Um, what, two string? And our board is called life. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. Okay, so we haven't grabbed our module yet. So we're on the right track. Now all we need to do is alias um, demo dot life. Ah, that looks good. So what's next? Any guesses? Next generation, where does it go? In the tick, right? So, so basically I could say I, I can assign a socket, right? And what am I assigning? Life. But we want to. We want this is the next generation, right? This is getting a little ugly, so let's pretty that up a little. And we want to call the next generation here, right? Oh. Keyword argument must be followed by space after life. Life. Oh, here we go. A rogue comma. Okay, let's see what's breaking. Oh, okay. Uh, we're not. Socket data. So oh, it's in life. <laughs> yeah, see, it's working. <laughs> no, what's actually happening is we have a crashing loop, right? And so we have to debug this crash. Okay, so what's happening? Life.nextGeneration, so we're taking a board, we're basically passing the board in. Let's do this, life equals, see if we can get a better error message. Okay. Okay. A 
Okay, here we go. We're getting, getting an RE. Okay, so we're doing an Erlang apply. Oh, we're trying to grab height from this thing. So is the next generation returning the board? Let's take a look and see. Okay, I bet I know the problem. So next generation, what's this actually returning? This is returning tuples, right? Right? So this is the um, grid. All right. Now we got it. And I want to return the board, but I want to update the grid. I want to set the grid to grid like that. Okay. Oh, this is killing me. Okay, now I get an argument. Okay, I'm just going to bounce the server. I think that this should be working. And it is. All right. Right on the minute. It's it's 10:45. Okay, so um, in conclusion, what we've actually shown you is that we spent about about 80 percent of our time on the business model and about 20 percent of our time doing the doing the interactive web UI, which is almost exactly backwards of a typical application. So I have about 100,000 lines of code invested in a new project. And I can tell you that putting yourself in the headspace on the server changes everything. And that's it. Can we take two questions? We can take one or two. Yeah, right here. I'll just get the mic. Uh, so two questions that may go together. One, yeah. what's the communication protocol between the server and the client? Yes. And two, are using some kind of a virtual DOM to reduce the, uh, the diff? Yeah, so the virtual DOM is MorphDOM. It's a JavaScript framework. Um, and, but basically, I don't touch any of that. Like you saw, all of that is managed by the framework, which it should be, right? Um, and the nice thing about that is that um, when you saw the substitution, the substitution does an Elixir-based reduction to see if the variable it has changed um, in, in memory, right? And then, um, if it's changed, it actually sends down the HTML associated with that variable um, so that you get the minimum set sent down, right? So the communication protocol, um, it's, it's, over, uh, it's over HTTP sockets. It's over Phoenix channels, basically. Is that like a web socket? That's that a web thing? socket. Okay, cool. Perfect. That's a web socket. Cool. Yep. Thanks. Sure. Another question. Uh, over here. Yeah, so live view is very nice. Uh, uh, like, where do you see like this is disadvantage or where we can't use live view? Where can you use live view? Yeah. So, so I tried to use in dashboard and a couple of things, but uh, do you see like uh, the some area where where you can't use? So I am seeing four things that that are dramatically different for me. Right. So the first thing is that. Um, one, one, of the, one of the problems that I'm trying to solve is um, building an interactive lesson, right? And so I can actually do a lot of my modeling in OTP, um, and I can, I can stay away from database persistence for a very long time and actually work on my models and work on the live views, uh, the live views like this um, for, gosh, weeks before I ever touch a database and before I ever write a single migration. That makes a huge amount of difference, right? So the second thing is that there are all these tiny JavaScript things that we've, we've taken for granted that must be done in JavaScript. Like um, when you expand and contract little pieces of a page, um, that is so natural to do on the server side. 
I just keep a I just keep a map of the expanded and contracted sections and then show them or don't show them based on their state. Right? So the third thing is that it is possible to build a better performing application um, using JavaScript, but you have to be so very careful, right? So if you have a, a, typical, a typical team and, um, and typical application development processes, um, it's sometimes better to let the computer do the work and compute the minimum set, right? So, um, so I know that everybody is looking at this demo and say, saying, well, that's probably, that's probably taking a long time to do the back and forth, right? But think about how much work we throw away for the, for the typical web environment, right? So look at a talk that Chris McCord does at ElixirConf this year, and he has something called the atomic trash can. And he has all these things that are computed and thrown away for every single web request. And all that is, um, is just kind of, it's, it's maintained in the single session, so it does much less work. Um, and the fourth thing that I think is coming is, is Elixir is also a very good environment for the Internet of Things. And so you can imagine that right now we're seeing this done with HTML. Well, what if we put this behind something like SVG, right? The principles are exactly the same, right? And that's, that becomes it's a really cool way of, of, um, of modeling the world. Um, what it doesn't do well is, um, is applications that have to run online or I mean have to run offline. Um, and also if there's a lot of drag and drop, um, those types of things, um, a lot of mouse um, tracking that you need to do on the user interface, it doesn't do those well yet, but I imagine that those types of applications are coming. 